I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Jeremy Reese for a presentation on materials design and engineering for breakthrough aerospace and advanced propulsion design. In this comprehensive presentation, Jeremy will begin with the basic chemical nature of matter and progress from well-known design materials into metamaterials and other novel and exotic materials that may have uses in spacecraft design or advanced propulsion applications. Jeremy has been exploring concepts in UAP propulsion systems for over a decade and has built a massive online audience who trust and rely on his scientific and technology analysis. All right, so a little bit about me. I have a bachelor's degree in physics with a minor in math from Bridgewater State University. I went on and off uh, for a number of years, switched my major to business management, then I switched it back to physics and I eventually graduated in 2012. In the meantime, uh, in between, I did a lot of work in construction and materials. I worked for uh, Foxborough and Invensys doing some chemical engineering and got some back, um, you know, end experience in, in industrial automation and control systems. Um, I've been interested in mainly in metamaterials and quasi crystals since about 2004 or, or so when I got into researching those types of things and, and all this type of stuff in general. Um, and uh, I'm basically a human resources coordinator and uh, I meet lots of interesting people and I connect them and, and, and network them together with people I think that they'd work well with. Um, and so I, I've just been, you know, trying to link, link together the people and, and identify the sources of good information, the sources of good materials um, and good different knowledge and, and subject matter experts on various things to kind of piece this whole puzzle together about what we should be building. Um, take my money, love your channel. Uh, since you were on the Timcast, thanks to uh, Dr. Fox 2000 there in the live chat um, for, for uh, giving me $10 in the live chat on YouTube. Sorry, I have to call these out or uh, people, so people will donate more money to us to keep this thing going. So anyways, uh, this is uh, Feynman. Um, he did a um, presentation called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom back in, I think this the seventies um, on, nanotechnology in the future of you know building stuff on the small scale and what we need to do and just to give you a scale we can zoom in on this ice crystal um several hundred times and i think this is a magnification of uh what is it scale of one nanometer to i think this is a just a factor of a hundred and but anyways it we're talking about um the building blocks of nature uh we, we all have the same building blocks. Assume that aliens have the same building blocks as we do. They accept their periodic table is um, includes all of the other isotopes, like all the heavy, uh, heavy element, like heavier elements. Uh, not not like heavy elements up here, but elements with an extra neutron, which uh, change the isotope number without changing the the element number. And um, we have a particle zoo, of course, in particle physics, the standard model, which uh, is the best we have right now until a better theory comes along. Um, we have up and down quark, charm, strange, top, bottom, this Higgs boson field that kind of like holds everything together and gives it mass. Uh, the Z and W bosons, the W has a positive and negative boson. Um, then we have photons, which is kind of like this electromagnetic force, and then gluons, which hold these nuclei together inside the nucleus. Um, it's a really messy model, as uh, our last present presenter explained, and uh, there's a lot of um, attempts to unify it through geometric unity and, and other such theories. One of one uh, one of such theory that I looked at uh, was called Phoenix theory, the physics of entanglement networks and information exchanges, by a guy named Ken Griggs, uh, who was studied under Sasha Migdal and oh, um, Jim Gates. Um, trying to relate string theory. And he, he related a lot of his research to um, Lewis Kaufman, the mathematician on knots and knot theory and trying to come up with a new theory of, of particle physics based on knots. But regardless of how it all works under the hood, um, we still have the same kind of, uh, you know, building blocks for our universe to what we can, what we have to build with. So um, these are the isotopes. So like all these elements right here is just this black line right through the middle. And then there's all these isotopes on either side showing um, that are stable that, you know, some of these aren't even aren't stable and the further that you drift off, they just don't don't even exist. But these are the all everything we've pretty much mapped out all the way up to these uh, higher elements, which we've 
we're still mapping out. Um, there's something called, um, oh, let's break down the periodic table to, so we can kind of like, uh, you know, understand it a little bit better. We have all these non-metals over here and non-metals are usually, uh, are usually uh, positively charged um, cations, uh, sorry, anions are negatively charged. So non-metals are usually negatively charged and, and uh, metals are usually positively charged. They're alkaline. That's where the, the, you know, they make batteries out of them and, and stuff. Um, and the matching rules based on opposite sides of this table um, will base on what kind of things can match with what. And, the, and it's just all about filling these, these outer isotope, uh, outer uh, shells with the Lewis structure. But really there's some interesting behavior right around here because there's, there's metals that kind of like are, are metalloids. They're not, you know, this line right down the middle, like bismuth, silicone, arsenic, tellurium, and actinium. Um, it's kind of like these, they're metalloids. They're not really metals. They're, they're not, they're somewhat in between. And then there's also uh, bismuth, which is kind of an interesting metal we'll get to later. Um, but a lot of these metals have interesting properties and we're going to go through kind of them. It's not way, you know, as much as we try to classify them based on, you know, they, they have similar kind of kinds of properties based on this, this table of elements, like the families going up and down and also the, the uh, periods going left and right. But um, really, every element is kind of its own little building block, and it's kind of important to understand them as an as a you know. Oh, they are they aren't seeing the presentation on that screen, so I have to uh, I have to switch. Hold up, I have to switch my OBS because they're not seeing the presentation on their screen. Hold up, ah yes, hold up a second. So display capture, I'm going to properties and we're going to there. Boom. All right. So, all right. So I fixed it. Sorry. They weren't seeing my screen before. Now they are. All right. So um, we have a bunch of these building blocks and it's based on the, the size of the nucleus, uh, how much mass is inside and how much charge there is kind of gives you this whole, um, <laughs> Greg Chase just threw a hundred bucks in the super chat. Keep up the great work and don't give up. Bio nerd said, can't see the presentation. Also, when can I pre-order my Tic Tac crap? So yeah, these are the, this was the presentation so far. I wanted to show some of those slides to the audience out there because they didn't get to see them all. All right. So um, yeah, this was the Phoenix theory. This was the Higgs boson and all the particle physics. This was our table of building blocks. And uh, that's me with some of my math professors on my graduation day. Um, so metals versus non-metals. Um, non-metals form anions. They're dull, color, color, colorless to colorful. They're poor conductors. They're brittle. They have a low melting point, often liquids or gases at room temperature and not, not sonorous. Yeah, so a lot of these things are actually gases at um, you know, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, fluorine, chlorine, and um, hydrogen and helium of course they're all really gases uh i think the um hydrogen's the the smallest i mean helium's the smallest atom that there is and um size wise but they all have uh they all have different they all kind of fit together in different ways based on their size if you can kind of think of like spheres and spheres pack sphere packing a little bit but um a little bit different so these molecules and these atoms, we, we uh, sorry, the atoms we have in our periodic table of chemical elements um, combined, and I'm having trouble going through these slides one at a time, to form molecules. And molecules can be left or right-handed. So left and right-handed molecules that are opposites of one another are called enantiomers, mers. And um, it's based on, you know, chiral symmetry. So they're, they're the same in a mirror as the other one. And then there's uh, chemical isomers which is just basically they have the same chemical like composition, you know, it's still, you know, H, you know, C3, H6, uh, H7, F1 uh, or whatever. It's still the same, but it's just a different arrangement of those things. And that's different than a, a nuclear isomer, which is a, which is basically like a, if, you know, the isomers has equal, it has equal N, equal A and equal Z, you know, so an isotope has, you, you know, the equal Z, we have the same proton number, we just change the neutron number. 
um, ISO bars, that's equal A, um, which is, I, I believe, chart, uh, sorry, and isotones. And then, so there's a whole bunch of different variations of nuclei and, and ways to change these nuclei around based on energy levels, you know, and there's one that's uh, an isomer that we know of that's the lowest one we know of is uh, actually hafnium tantalum isomer. And uh, that one is the lowest stable one. And will actually, it's, it actually switches between hafnium and tantalum. It will go back and forth because the, 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 uh, the, um, the numbers switch around or whatever. You know they can switch they can switch around so they stay equal but they 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 inter they interchange in a way so nuclear we have nuclear isomers um vibranium um i mentioned that's kind of like what, 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 we, what we mentioned by something that changes it's actually like transmuting it's an element that's transmuting stably but you have to keep it stable by energizing it with gammas and there might be ways to create um, more hyper stable elements using by keeping them stable using isomers, but basically combining it with a gamma uh, to keep it stable because um, it, it has these decay chains through um, that decay into different things. So it changes from so it, it can transmute readily based on those decay chains. But anyways, um, when we have mixtures of metals and uh, we have metals have melt and all these metals and solids have melting points you know, and liquid where there are things where there are solid liquid and gas, we know about phases and um, building things, you know, sometimes require, you know, changing phase of certain materials for different applications, um, mixing uh, metals to form alloys. Um, metals are, are separated into two uh, classifications, ferrous, non-ferrous. Uh, ferrous is anything that contains iron, including like steel, and then non-ferrous uh, super alloys, light metals like aluminum, magnesium, beryllium, titanium, cobalt, uh, tantalum, and tungsten. Um, then there's non-metals, which can be used to make, you know, plastics, composites, and ceramics, including um, what are called refractories, uh, like fire bricks and stuff. And uh, Refractory, um, the word refractory means it refracts light. So it, it can um, withstand a lot high, really high temperatures like fire brick. And that's where refractory metals get the name refractory metals. And that's a section of these transition metals on the periodic table, which have a really high melting point above 2000 Celsius and a really high hardness at room temperature. They're chemically inert and have a relatively high density. Um, tan, you know, tantalum, for example, uh, is, is uh, used, a lot of these are used in, in bone and, and transplants and like limb transplants because they don't really, um, they don't really, uh, you know, cause, uh, what's it called? They don't cause inflammation. They don't cause reaction to skin tissue. Your body doesn't reject them. So um, a lot of those metals are used for that and, and other, other things. So these metals are a particular part of the periodic table that are, are, are of interest. Um, titanium, there's a Kroll method for purifying it that, um, that, that they use to make this uh, kind of sponge uh, cake of different purities and they, they, they take off the different pieces. Um, but sponges are an interesting thing because uh, you can, it turns out a lot of different metals can be used to make sponges and uh, also, you know, other things like, like aerogel is a silica sponge, but, but the, it's like silica gel, but the gel has been replaced with air. Um, to make aerogel. And uh, so these kinds of um, aerogels and aerosponges, including open cell and porous titanium, they're um, super interesting uh, uh, to research because um, they could they can pass air through them and you could also possibly electrically charge these, uh, these surfaces in different layers um, by printing them of different materials of different conductivity. So um, there's a lot of research that still needs to be done in, in, in you know, these types of materials in, in aerospace. Um, I think there's a lot of research that's being done, but um, not all of it is uh, not all of its public knowledge yet at this point. But certainly, um, <clears throat> these aerogel, these aero sponges are are certainly a, an area of interest to uh, you know people who've done Bifel Brown effect or or any kind of um, in in just just in aerodynamics in general because they're they're so they can be built to be custom aerodynamic. Uh, tantalum kind of has this interesting structure as well. And again, it's, it's really, uh, it has really good response to the human uh, for implants and stuff. There's, um, 
a mix of 1.6 tantalum to 1 tellurium forms a chalcogenide quasi-crystal, um, which is a dodecagonal um, quasi-crystal, which, sorry, a dodecagonal, a phase is, and uh, sorry, it's distinguished by the presence of crystallographically forbidden 12-fold rotational symmetry in uh, the diffraction pattern. So this is actually tantalum can form quasi-crystals. Um, some of these metals can form uh, quasi-crystals. This is one of the few that form it with a bimetallic alloy. Most of them are actually uh, trimetallic alloys. You need three um, elements to form quasi-crystals. Uh, quasi-crystals are pretty interesting stuff um, when you research them because they, they have a lot of interesting applications. Um, when I started researching these back in 2012, uh, they don't have the same, they don't have like a single fault line. So they could be made uh, into, you know, really strong or durable materials. Although we'll get into other strong, durable materials and, and better ways of, of doing those a little bit later. What they're really interesting is their, their hypersymmetry and that, you know, the fact that you can, they have a symmetry on, an, on a higher level outside, but on the in, innate scale, you can change individual parts and, and, uh, and still maintain this greater symmetry. So they have a lot of application for photonic waveguides, um, 5D, there's also 5D optical data storage. It's not really quasi-crystals. Um, this is actually a nanostructured glass. Um, I believe it's like quartz. And it's for permanently recording digital data using a femtosecond laser writing process. This is established technology. It's not theoretical. This is real. They've done this. Uh, the memory crystal is capable of storing 360 terabytes of data for billions of years. It has a really, really, really stable um, structure. You know, it's really stable in these crystal structures and, and it can last really long periods of time, um, much longer than a floppy disk drive or a magnetic uh, disk um, or even a CD. Uh, first experimentally demonstrated in 2013, Hitachi and Microsoft have been developing this technology ever since. Um, Quasi crystals are used. Uh, this is an Eric Quinones article from uh, Princeton New University. Um, their researchers built a uh, scale model of a quasi crystal using a bunch of straws, and they um, the straws were the length of the wavelength of microwave radiation that they shot out of this horn at it, and they noticed that it um, refract it it, did, it it basically reflected those signals at ninety degree angles with uh, perfect. Um, reflection without losing signal quality. So um, quasi crystals are certainly an interesting area of uh, research that I think should be pursued further for, you know, future spacecraft engineering research. Um, of course, it's the little bit different than metamaterials, which uh, these C ring loop resonators that we talked about. What's interesting is that you can place the C, the loops inside of one another to make a, a series of loops that each correspond to a different wavelength. So you can, you know, this one will be like red spectrum. This is orange, yellow, you know, green, blue, just to give a color code to get an idea of how this can be used to break down um, wavelengths and, uh, and frequencies that come in incoming into the craft. I'm, I'm not going to get into all of this stuff because I just going to give an overview of the materials, but, um, Again, yeah, they uh, have built these resonator arrays with these split C-ring resonators. Um, we believe there might be ways to do this on a smaller scale. Of course, when you get down to the atomic scale, once you get past a certain threshold, you no longer need the split uh, the C-ring resonators because what happens is the atoms themselves, actually the spins of the atoms themselves actually um, kind of work for you if you use the right atoms with the right you know, properties. So there's also acoustic metamaterials. Um, just like, you know, the structure of matter can bend light at, to its will, the structure of matter can bend sound to its will as well. Um, very interesting stuff. So this is like baffling that they use for soundproofing for recording booths and recording rooms. This is a, uh, I think they place a microphone inside this pyramid and it can't hear anything outside the pyramid because it dampens and, and, and redirects all the sound through the material structure. This is the world's quietest room. It's at a company in Ontario, uh, Canada. Um, I forget the name of the company. I had to, it's in my notes. Um, but there we go, notes. 
Yeah, it's the Echel noise control technology. So it's called EC, E-C-K-E-L, the world's quietest room. There's also acoustic uh, chiral metamaterials, okay, in nature. One of them is a seashell. You ever wonder why you put a seashell to your ear? You can hear all the air currents amplified, you know, so loudly inside the seashell. It's because it's a metamaterial. It's literally a chiral metamaterial, and it works similar to the cochlea inside your inner ear for amplifying noises and sounds. And then into this sort of uh, seashell shape, probably Fibonacci inspired spiral there. But um, in any case, uh, the chiral metamaterials, um, there's a company Ron Keita runs called Chirilex that's in investigating chiral quartz and some of these uh, effects of chiral symmetry and, and chiral metamaterials. Some very interesting research and uh, definitely something worth checking out for future experiments and spacecraft engineering materials. Then we get into metallic beetles. So we talked about metals and non-metals on that periodic table, but it turns out you can take purely organic compounds, non-metals, and make them look like metals um, by etching them. And these are etched, um, you know, bio biologically, but, you know, nature is sort of doing it in this case with these beetles and these skin coatings. But when we look at these different beetles under this SEM image, it looks like a series of, uh, a series of dots and dashes and it's just it's just basically like it, there's no color or no tonation which makes it look like that it's just basically the structures and how they uh, how they interact with light on the skin themselves it's nothing to do with the, the the composition of the material itself it's just the fact that it's not met it's not exactly metal it's 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 interacting like a metal because of its structure so Oh, uh, thank you to Infinitum Neo for the hundred dollar super chat. He said, "Great info. Thank you so much. That that's a, that's an awesome help, man. This is great." So we have um, we find out that if we etch University of Rochester, a guy named Dr. Chun Li Guo is doing research into materials, and he found out that if you etch these materials with a laser, do laser etching, micro and nano pitting, similar to these nano pitting on the bugs, but you try different, you know, patterns and different shapes, which we've learned from looking at the bugs, you know, this one makes gold, this one makes this iridescent green and, and whatnot. They're actually able to engineer materials that are hydrophobic. So they're two, these spacings in the, in the um, microstructures are actually tuned to water molecules specifically, and then they can do it to make them hydrophilic. So phobia means hate, phil philia means love. So hydrophilic materials are materials that love water. And you see how it goes right to the edge and sticks right to this, this material. It goes right off this, you know, super hydrophobic material in the middle. Most hydrophobic coatings that exist on the market presently um, work on chemical deposition of a layer of material that, that has this effect when the polymers dry out. It creates a surface very similar to this. This is the um, only... The, no application I know of where they can just laser treat a metal to give it this coating, which is really, really awesome to think about. So, um, so the, uh, NOSA in the chat says there are better methods for super hydrophobic and super hydrophilic. Um, yeah, I'd like to check those out, but this is, this one I just thought was cool because it relates to, you know, we can do the same thing. If we, we laser etch these sort of patterns, we can make it look like this bug. Um, or that gold color, or the green color, or whatever whatever kind of color we want it to, to look like. And I just thought that that was interesting. And then the application for if you take epoxy thin films and then etch each thin film and then apply them in layers, they're tuned to different layers. Um, you can make dielectric mirrors, which uh, we'll, we'll get into in just a second right down here. Um, but we'll talk about, you know, yeah, so I'll, I'll just get right into the dielectric mirrors and then we'll go back. So we have something called Bragg diffraction when a um, when incident, you know, light hits a crystal uh, or a structure and um, different frequencies transmute or, or go into the into the material at, you know, have different penetration depths to different um, have different interactions with every material. So certain frequencies will bounce right off the surface of the material and some frequencies will penetrate deeper into the material um, and then bounce around or some, sometimes they don't reflect back. But what a, a fo what a Bragg mirror does or a dielectric mirror does is it, it tunes each one of these layers to those next frequencies so that when they bounce off, they, they all, um, they, they, all these frequencies sort of bounce back off. And, uh, 
it's um very interesting what you can do so um examples of these are called dimensional crystals and uh that one would be a a 2d uh, or a 1d crystal so that would be a 1d see these layers so that's called an example of a 1d you add these wafers and, and it creates a 1d uh optical dimensional material and then if you get um a 2D one would be example of the surface, which is just a, like this. This is a, a forest of carbon nanotubes. And that's what Vantablack is. That stuff Vantablack is literally, it's a forest of carbon nanotubes. Uh, it's like a carpet of them. And the carpet of these nanotubes, um, it basically absorbs all the light that interacts with it. You know, or not all of it, but 90, you know, eight, 9% of it, you know, a ton of it. So... <laughs> Um, I think it's like 90 something percent of, of the uh, of the incident light it absorbs completely. Um, and that's an example of a 2D um, dimensional crystal or uh, optical metamaterial. And then they have 3D ones, which are more complex, which are those like quasi crystals and, and those other structures that um, we should be building in the future to run all of our electronics off of because we don't need to push electrons around anymore. We can push photons around. Um, and use we can build circuits that work on uh, photonic energies and the alignments of these spins of, of uh, carefully aligned atoms and molecules along the circuits. Once we are able to build that small, and um, and do those kinds of things, and it's all based on waves and waveguides and mirrors and, and and understanding that sort of technology and and but on a intricate um, atomic and 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 scalar lattice level. And that's the level as small as we can go. If we can go that small, we're dealing with, you know, it can't get much closer to alien technology until we get into the other building blocks. But it's basically chemistry all the way down, regarded how it works on, regardless of how it works under the hood in the land of unification field theories. Um, we know a lot about these kinds of materials. So next thing is shape retention um, alloys that I wanted to uh, mention on here. Um, shape retention alloys are important because they can deform and and hot and like you put it in hot water and it will it will go back into shape like nitinol wire you can deform it any which way you throw it into hot water and it goes back into shape um and it deals with these you know austenite and mar martensite um phases and how it can deform and go back into uh phase and yeah, it's interesting because it's just all about how certain molecules and certain types of atoms link together on this core, on this um, fundamental level. And we, as we learn more about that, we, we, we get to the topic of metallic glass, which is a real anomaly and almost a, a strange thing that almost shouldn't exist. But um, we talk about metal structures um, and the structures of just how things form in general. And this things can form in crystals or if it, it cools really slowly, it, it all kind of, um, it forms this, it forms like a hard crystal. And that's, this is what's called the solid state. Um, amorphous structures are like solid state, but they're kind of, they have like a 2% elastic limit, which is higher than any kind of metal or any kind of solid um, material. So they're really, really flexible. They're much more, they're, wood has an elastic limit of one, for example, um, and polymers have, you know, elastic limit, or, you know, upwards of, you know, 2.7%. 2, 2 um, so it's right around there. Plus it's got really high strength. So glass alloys and metallic glasses are, are um, really interesting, remarkable tier materials. Uh, I, I once compared them in a video to the, the Roswell memory foil that they uh, talked about that unbreakable like material that you could crinkle it up into a ball and it would unfold itself. Um, it's I, although I haven't seen any material exactly like that, um, any metallic glasses exactly like that material. Um, it is an interesting material. There's a, there's a um, video on um, liquid metal tuning forks that you guys can watch liquid metal technologies as a company that makes uh, these. Um, I don't know why that one didn't load. All right. Oh, this one's important. So this graph shows you um, imaging and tweezing and talks about, you know, the length of tissues and organs and cells. We can use, you know, MEMS and, and uh, scanning electron microscope uh, scopes to uh, kind of see on that level. 
um, then we can use optical and magnetic tweezing to kind of um, move things on that level. And then, you know, when we kind of want to see below, um, below, you know, cells and, and into um, proteins and, and maybe even into uh, atoms themselves, we got to go lower. But um, we use one of the um, types of tomography is uh, GPR and ultrasound imaging, which ultrasound, you know, uses really high frequency sound waves and creates and takes the bounce back and they can use it to image things that are inside of, you know, like the baby inside of uh, its mother or uh, also ground penetrating radar to see pipes and other stuff that's buried underneath the ground. Um, it's also very sim nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. They put you through a giant magnet and they um, use this tomography to basically create an image of you in slices and then add those slices together to get an image of your whole body. And that's kind of like, you know, it started, there's a whole thing on tomography. If you look it up, um, I have a whole, I had a whole page on it, um, but it's a, there's a long list of all like the, the history of, of the machines and where the technology has gone over the years and, and the methods and stuff. But we're basically what we're getting towards is, you know, optical tweezers and all this stuff. What we eventually want to get towards is, you know, that the fact that 3D printers will be known as ancient replicators. And we want to build, you know, this replicator from Star Wars. Um, there's a couple things about that. Not, we're not quite building a replicator with 3D printing. Um, 3D printing has its limitations, you know, additive called additive manufacturing. You know, certain things are still better to build on a CNC and milling machine. Um, and out of a cast solid piece because it's it's a lot lot stronger than something that's built up of a bunch of stuff that's been printed together um, something that's cast as a whole and then cut and reduced down through reductionist machine is sometimes better uh, you know is clearly superior than a lot of these other things and also it this would be limited to you know physical objects in your 3d printer you know you can you could I don't think they'll ever be able to 3D print you a frog or a, a biological living organism or even print it something this fast, you know, to come in. So, but who knows the, the future, the future may hold amazing things, but in any case, that's kind of what we're building up to, but we've got to keep it within the realms of realistics. Uh, composites are fabricating materials that involve mixing a metallic alloy in a solid state with reinforced particles or porous mass, and then infiltrating metallic alloy in the semi solid state. So you can also you know, mix different alloys with uh, you know, non-metals and stuff. Um, lots of different, um, lots of different, you know, expansion room and, and, I, and inventive ideas for composites and lots of room for invention there. Uh, carbon is, um, as we all know, has, is one of the building blocks that we definitely need to pay attention to. All, we're, we're, you and me were made out of carbon. Uh, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for carbon, uh, DNA, and all our, all our life forms. Um, we love carbon because it forms really long chains, and and really long chains are useful for building stuff like DNA and humans and uh, little kittens. So we love carbon. Um, it's also stuff we burn, hydrocarbons. It's there's a lot of energy in those bonds, so we use it for fuel. Um, and it's currently the you know biggest fuel source on the planet until one of us invents free energy. <laughs> so definitely um, carbon buckyballs. So there's a bunch of different Buckminster fullerenes. There's uh, bucky tubes that can be formed from rolling graphene sheets into tubes. Um, graphite, of course, can be made into graphene through the scotch tape method or, or uh, electrostatic confinement and uh, other methods. But um, there's also um, printable, you know, we know that carbon can be made into diamond. That's another isomer uh, or, or type of, um, you know, is the diamond shape. So we, we can arrange, if you pack lots of carbon really close together, you heat it up and you pack it real tight, you can make diamond. Um, there's also printable diamond, um, this stuff called polyhydridocarbine, which uh, it's called our PHC. It's a uh, polymer that may be readily fabricated into various forms like films, fibers, plates, and then thermalized into a final hexagonal diamond ceramic. Upon thermolysis, uh, oh, thermolysis in argon at atmospheric temperature and pressure of 110 degrees Celsius to 1000 degrees Celsius, decomposition of 
polyhydrocarbene results in hexagonal diamond or lonsdaleite. Uh, lonsdaleite, as you know, um, it's a translucent um, diamond. It's hard, it's uh, about 58% harder than a diamond, uh, you know, a natural diamond. And, um, you know, it's produced through uh, by a number of companies, uh, synthetic diamonds in a number of different ways. This is from Genesis Diamonds. And this is Genesis Diamonds Laboratory and their, their um, methods for manufacturing diamonds um, and the high pressure types of uh, environments that they use for that. Uh, carbon chains, yes, as we know, um, they're pretty much define three huge realms of chemistry just on carbon alone. So it's very important for chemists, uh, biological, inorganic chemistry and organic chemistry are all um, directly re related or linked to uh, carbon and what can be formed with carbon. Um, the other one right under carbon, of course, is another key building block, just where it sits on the periodic table. It's just, it's just in the middle, straight down the middle of everything. So it kind of just it branches off to everything, if you think about it, where it sits on the periodic table. Um, same with silicone. I mean, silicon, uh, sorry, it'd be important to um, make this distinction because we always, it's, it's really easy to say the wrong thing because it's silicon is the element. That's what they mine out of the earth. It's the second most abundant element on earth after oxygen. Um, silica is quartz or glass it's actually silicon dioxide it's produced from the reaction between silicon and oxygen and there's silicone which is produced from the reaction between silicon oxygen carbon and or hydrogen and it's a kind of like a gel or um and well the silica gel is is silica and then so yeah it's very confusing but i think it's i think we straightened it out so High melting point, um, high boiling point, bluish grain, metal sheen. Um, it's used in semiconductors and computer circuits and other electronics. Of course, if you take the arrow, if you take silica gel and replace the um, water with air, it makes aerogel, which is um, really heat resistant and, temp and, and fire resistant. It's good, um, you know, fire block material. It's also got very good compressive strength. Not that you can, it will cut with a knife. It, it's not, you know, super strong or, or rigid material, but it, it will support weight, some weight. And um, then there's also graphene aerogel, which is just basically like, you know, graphene, but in an aerogel form or with lots of gaps or air between. And there's even, you know, 3D printed lattices of this to make it even more um, light, even lighter and, and, uh, there's lots of applications with um, graphene aerogels uh, currently. Dr. Tian Yu Li at Lee's lab in uh, the University of California in Santa Cruz is doing work on a 3D printing of three-dimensional graphene aerogels with periodic macro pores for supercapacitor electrodes. Um, there's also uh, another number of universities doing experiments with uh, nanoporous graphene membranes and also, you know, gra graphene channels that, that mimic or rep uh, replicate the action of biological ion channels uh, so they can open up or um, these pores in the, in the surface of these uh, graphene sheets to let different molecules of different sizes through um, depending. But um, in any case, uh, then we have 3D graphene, yeah, Bayes sensors and piezoelectric switches. So they have these graphene structures that when they press them together, they create these electrical switches or uh, also piezoelectric uh, voltage, you know, um, needles, uh, you know, whatever, uh, pressure sensors, if you will, through um, piezoelectric action of the graphene, um, which is also interesting application for the, for the graphene. Um, is it the wonder material? We've all hailed that it was. That it was. Um, I think so. I think that you know anyone who under, you know, sort sort of underscores the uh, virtues of graphene hasn't really done the research, and it's really underfunded um, right now, as far as I can tell. Uh, it's strong. It's thin. It's conductive. It's truly two dimensional. It's stretchable, and it's multidisciplinary for in a, and it has a lot of applications in a lot of different fields. So I just believe we haven't even begun to see the um, 
the full extent of applications of, of graphene yet. And it's definitely a technology that we need to consider in our, um, in our experiments going forward and in the future. Piezoelectricity, of course, uh, it's exhibited in graphene, but we all, we all know it came from quartz originally and or uh, PZT, lead zirconate titanate. Um, same kind of idea. That's the um, interesting stuff when you vibrate quartz or uh, tension in compressed quartz. It produces a voltage and well yeah gra graphene's cool but there's lots of other stuff out there that we're, we're looking into and stuff as well as graphene so that we'll, we'll get into it so let me let me continue Ferroelectricity, electricity spontaneous electrical polarization discovered discovered in 1920 by in in rochelle salt by j valasek okay so he made this Rochelle salt. This is a this is a large crystal of Rochelle salt that was grown on Skylab. Um, it turns out that if you grow this uh, salt in zero gravity, it, the crystals that it forms are much more uh, ferroelectric than the normal crystals grown on Earth. And so that is just some of the research that you know, NASA and other organizations have done into crystal growth in space, and a lot of it's based on you know these materials. Um, the ferroelectric materials led eventually to the, dis the discovery of, uh, you know, nonlinear optical materials, these multiferroics like barium titanate, which we'll get into in a second. Um, ferromagnetism, of course, is just a, ma a magnet. It has a natural, you know, iron, like natural iron has, uh, is ferromagnetic. That means it's like a permanent magnet, you know, just naturally. Paramagnetic means it will line up and become a magnet as soon as you, you put, you know, um, any kind of a magnetic field on it. So like an iron bar that's not magnetized is paramagnetic. It will become magnetized. But if it's ma already magnetized, then it's ferromagnetic. And if it doesn't, doesn't get magnetized at all and it's completely inert, then it's, you know, diamagnetic. And then ferroelectricity is like kind of like the analog between, you know, ferromagnetic and ferroelectric. It means it responds, it becomes electrically polarized within a field if you apply a field to it. And these curves right here, see these curves, those are called hysteresis curves. And we'll get into those in a second, talk about those, because they're, they're, uh, they come into play. The transistor diodes and solid state physics goes back to Walter Schottky and uh, also those guys at um, Bell Labs who invented the transistor, who doing a lot of the theory on solid state physics and group theory and essentially the, the, the core you know physics into how to build these kinds of uh, materials that, that were used to build the first uh, the first transistor that did not come from aliens, as uh, Philip Corso says. It definitely came from human scientists working on it for decades before that. And it was all, um, it's all there. So uh, cold fusion is kind of related to these metal halide lattices. I had to throw this in somewhere, so I threw it in here. Um, I apologize for that, but a metal hydride lattices like palladium, um, in cold fusion experiments, they put um, heavy water plus an electrolyte, and then they charge this cathode, a palladium cathode. And um, there's a saturation point of about 94% uh, deuterium to palladium that you need in order to receive the reaction, um, according to um, Mitchell Schwartz and uh, the MIT guys at like Peter Hagelstein. Mitchell Schwartz was the experimentalist doing the research on cold fusion at MIT, who I talked to and came up with this along with several other scientists who are uh, working in the field who have kind of agreed that MIT um, replications were down here around 0 0.86, 0 0.88, where they've gotten no results. And so they didn't get their um, loading ratios high enough within their crystal lattices to achieve uh, what, what we've reported, or what numerous scientists have reported is uh, fusion actually taking place in, a, in, a lat in the lattice structure of the, these cells. Um, there's physics that can explain this. Um, there's a new uh, theory out there by, you know, there's several theories out there of, of, with um, physics that explain kind of how these reactions can take place within metal lattices based on, um, based on lattice effects and also like vibrations and, and, and Bremsstrahlung radiation, uh, Cherkinov radiation and other ways of sharing um, Lattice, sharing, uh, sharing an excitation across a lattice. And so that, that's what takes, allegedly takes care of the, the gammas in these experiments. Interesting stuff. But um, 
again, that might have some relation to, again, it's not really ready about how we, readily, um, uh, it's not really apparent how we can use cold fusion to get energy, a technology out of it yet. Um, but I'm sure that through material science and maybe some of these experiments will be able to direct that energy as the, and those lattice vibrations from cold fusion and, and maybe make a, uh, some, some sort of device that can actually utilize that, that energy instead of losing it all to the, to a lattice. Um, but in any case, uh, more more work needs to be done in that field and more research, I believe, because energy, our, our, our spacecraft is of course going to need an energy source and uh, pound for pound, uh, cold fusion is the, you know, a real good bet for, you know, fuel source being abundant in water and, um, the energy output that we get, uh, from, from it. So, um, in any case, uh, we we'll to talk about perovskites and high efficiency photovoltaics. So it turns out that certain types of materials are, work really good as photovoltaic materials. And those metal halides uh, tend to work really good, uh, but perovskites are probably one of the best. Um, and they're used to, to make, uh, you know, bismuth ferrite is currently used to make um, some pretty, pretty uh, heavy duty um, solar panel material and solar cell material, but through material science and construction of lattices, we might be able to um, effectively make this kind of stuff even better. And we'll talk about that in a second. Bismuth, uh, the most diamagnetic element, it has the highest, you know, it's basically the spinniest, has the most, the highest uh, spin. Um, nuclear spins and magnetic resonance, this uh, kind of where the material world meets the quantum world. Um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting realm to play around with. And I think that you know, as we're learning with some of our research into Alzafon, um, who I mentioned here in a second, it's it's definitely something that the aerospace companies and, and the government uh, and military have looked at as far as um, a source, you know, understanding atomic spins and atomic spin orbits of, of these materials. It's definitely has something to do with it. We, we've investigated material called spin glass, another one that, um, it's basically like a, a glass, but you are injecting these atoms into the surface of this material, which have these aligned spins or, or you know, pre predestined spins, or even materials which line up to the, the spins readily. And um, so that you could basically create like local magnetic monopoles, even though it won't be a real magnetic monopole, you could almost create local ones on the surface of the craft through these, you know, really you know, strange electromagnetic effects, which would appear on the surface of these craft if you could coat them with uh, spin glass. And, um, you know, these spin and, and advanced optical glasses, um, they're basically, it's basically like you're condensing light and matter. And, but also there's, uh, it, it's a, it's, you create what's called a Fermi liquid. And um, Fermi liquids are quite interesting. Um, it's similar to a Fermi gas. It creates, it, it hits this, uh, this sort of critical point with temperature and pressure um, where, where along this curve right here, um, it, stays, it stays classically critical. And um, this is all in Landau's Fermi liquid theory, which you can look up but it's a, basically a whole new state of matter that is yet to be explored. It's, it's very, it's very cutting edge and new, and um, it might be some interesting things to explore in there. Uh, mercury is another interesting uh, thing. Of course, it's very dangerous. We mentioned about doing ex some experiments with mercury earlier, and uh, there are a, a number of groups out there um, currently looking into do some um, experiments with mercury. We've all heard of this, uh, nuclear powered flying triangle that Ed Fouché talked about in 1998, although maybe some of you haven't yet, but he, uh, he was the guy that was came out in, at IUFOC in 98 and talked about this flying triangle craft that uh, spun mercury plasma doped with a bunch of other earth elements and uh, whatnot. And he also talked about uh, quasi crystals and metamaterials, which were really before a lot of the research was being done publicly into metamaterials or quasi crystals. It's really hard to find references to any of that stuff pre 1998. Um, but he's a guy that um, 
worked at all the right places to have been out at area 51 back in the early eighties, late seventies and seen some stuff. And, uh, he's certainly an interesting guy, even if, uh, he doesn't have a lot of evidence to back up his stories. It's, um, unfortunate. That's sometimes what we have to work off of. Um, of course, doing some research into rotating mercury spin gravity research. Uh, we came across a guy named Henry William Wallace of, from Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, who, was a general electric employee. And apparently he had said some of these ideas uh, about his anti-gravity thing with rotating mercury to some friends of his at work. And he had a pat, he, he actually patented an idea on it. And it turns out that the military was um, also, you know, doing research into and had built his patent and were, were researching his same idea for this kinematic effect or uh, gravito magnetic field. And, um, you know, we had talked about this Tokamak reactors um, being repurposed for some of these experiments um, on plasma currents. And because um, plasma is an interesting, it's like the fourth state, it's the, the, the fourth state of matter above a gas. So you have an extra degree of freedom. And, and there's been a lot of um, research into what plasmas can do and different types of plasmas. And you mentioned red mercury as being, you know, I, I think, um, who is that? Evan, was that Ronald? <sighs> Who, who mentioned that, um, sorry, I forget who it was earlier that mentioned it was barium titanate in the uh, red mercury, but it, it might be other things. It, if it, it could be also a liquid alloy of uh, mercury, um, that ammonia. Was Paul Murad. Paul yeah, Murad. that was Paul. Paul Murad said that red mercury was barium with, was mixing some barium titanate in with the mercury. We might have some interesting effects. Also, um, plasmas have, uh, some plasmas are near superconductors. That's interesting. Yeah. So this, um, again, this, uh, ferroelectric hysteresis curve of where you can pump, um, energy into the electric field and the polarization. Um, there's a paper from 1966 on superconductors and gravitational drag by Bryce Dewitt, on um, which is also interesting showing that some, some of the theoretical work that was being done as early as 1966, into um, you know superconductors or, or rotating plasmas and gravitational drag, and trying to understand gravitational drag and in terms of uh, these these really large weight rotating you know it's kind of like your flywheels that you guys were building but a really really huge flywheel you know so um, I believe this was related to um, Boeing's Alzafan anti gravity study of 1981 with um, rotating nuclei and nuclear um, orientation as, as a uh, concept for affecting gravity. Um, gra NASA had a gravity probe B. Um, they were uh, experimenting with the frame dragging effect of this, this satellite um, as it went around the earth. And apparently they, their results were positive. There is frame dragging, there is, a, there is an effect. So it's, it's uh, quite possible that, that, that if you have uh, your atoms aligned as little gyroscopes, there could be uh, some kind of a similar a, a frame dragging effect or um, gravitational effect. So that's an area for investigation with materials as well, which why I included it. Um, the next is barium titanate crystals. Um, barium titanate, super interesting. Barium um, titanate was actually discovered uh, where they were doing a lot of research into the ferroelectrics. Um, and ferroelectric materials, um, super ferro ferroelectric materials like barium titanate. So it becomes a photorefractive effect. So the photorefractive effect is a nonlinear optical effect. And it's seen certain crystals and other materials that respond to light by altering their refractive index. So this material actually alters the refractive index of light. The effect can be used to store temporary erasable holograms and is useful for holographic data storage. It can also be used to create a phase conjugate mirror or an optical spatial soliton. These are all really important, you know, key things if we were, were to understand um, light, uh, gra gravity as a, as a field of um, the electromagnetic field, as a part of the electromagnetic field. Because these nonlinear optical materials will teach us ways to kind of trick light and trick possibly ways to trick gravity if gravity behaves anyway similar to light or on frequencies that can be operated 
by, you know, say it's all light frequencies at once. We understand, you know, some of these concepts combined, we might be able to build things that can, um, you know, break gra optical gravity by, re re, uh, by recreating the spatial holograms. You know, if gravity is kind of like a hologram, we can kind of recreate the spatial hologram for the craft and, and kind of break gravity using these um, spatial holograms via these phase conjugate mirrors. Um, which are really interesting materials. It's like a mirror that, you know, wherever you turn it, no matter which way you turn it, you're always seeing your reflection on the mirror. It's always, you're always bouncing it back to your, you, you're always looking at yourself. And um, they're used in this experiment right here on phase conjugate mirrors. I want to play this video. I'm going to go find this video and play it real quick. Isn't the phase conjugate mirrors what Apollo left on the moon for uh Taking the distance to the moon. That was a little different. That was actually a, um, it was a, it was a special kind of a mirror array, and it was an. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if it was a fit. It was a face conjugate mirror. I'll have to look into that, Mark. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. It might be. You might be right. I'll have to look into that. I think it was a ray. It was an array of mirrors at 90 degrees. So it like made that effect. That the light would bounce up from one mirror to another. And no matter which angle you came at, it would uh, shoot right back to you. Two right angles. Yeah, that makes sense. It might, it, it, yeah, it, it probably was. It would be easier to target it that way if it was phase conjugate. Yeah, because then they could, they could target it much easier. They probably did make it like that. But yeah, it just goes to show you like little things like that were not told to the public. They're just like, yeah, it's just a mirror up there. But they wouldn't give you these little details. A lot of these details were classified for, for many, many years as this research was being done. So it's, it's good that this is all coming out to the public now about this. So this is uh, optical technology. They show this, um, the hologram of the, the face. Um, I forget who the guy is in the, in the hologram. I think it's Max Planck or something, but... So they uh, find the focal point and that's where they put the beam splitter right at that focal point. So this mirror is reflecting this, it goes this way and then it reflects back. So now it's not reflecting anymore with this. Um, they put this cup over it. It, it breaks up the beam and, and, and messes it up. It's cause it's got like frosted glass. And then they take this, conjugate mirror and see that they 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 twisted it and they 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 twist it till it goes into phase and and it has to like it goes into resonance and phase conjugate mirrors only work at resonance so that this that phase conjugate mirror is tuned to that laser frequency and you see how that that happened um it it, it tuned it, it tuned rather quickly it didn't come instantly that mirror didn't that mirror didn't reflect the image instantly it it, it sort of it resolved it slowly see that how it came it didn't come on in, in instantly it kind of like it took a second to resolve the image because it's literally doing optical calculations which is why i was like you know i, I suggested that you know jack sarfati in our other our, our other lecture that his um a lot of these calculations that he's talking about could be done optically with the right optical materials and this is this is what i'm talking about so this basically this forms a diffraction and all this it breaks up all the light going across there so it all bounces uh, all these different directions now that mirror literally f f has to find back all those paths through the glass to find the, 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 the exact paths back but it eventually resolves them all through optical computation and the, re the image comes into re resonance and resolution on the screen so if we can think of gravity as an imaging you know an imaging technology um, or an optical imaging technology using the right kind of phase conjugate mirrors, which again, this phase conjugate mirrors are tuned to that frequency of light. So if we can build phase conjugate mirrors, which are tuned to the frequency of gravity, um, we could potentially um, trick gravity into the illusion of, of, of um, our hologram of, the, of that it's that it's in a different spot. And the way, one way to potentially do that is through uh, what's called four wave mixing. Um, interaction between three wavelengths produces this fourth wavelength, and then you could use that fourth wavelength uh, as a pump beam. So it might be possible to uh, resonate at the right at the frequency of gravity using you know phase conjugate mirror materials um, applied to a surface of, of our craft in the right way, 
and in conjunction with uh, four wave mixing so that we could you know use that to lit to um, bend the local fabric of space time as uh, as we're trying to do with these and these skin craft these skins uh, skin coatings and skin structures so ideas um, were a couple of different things that I wanted to mention as far as uh, chemistry goes and, and with the types of chemistry and uh, physics that we need to be looking into, I think, I believe are uh, plasmon polaritons, phonon polaritons, which are vibrational uh, lattice, you know, vibrations, uh, polaritons. Then there's exciton polaritons, which are um, excited states within the material. Um, then the Cooper pair polaritons, which are like those, uh, ma like magic angle graphene and some of those other uh, um, types of materials where where you could you uh, line up these states to create these uh, Cooper pairing and um, or su in superconductors even in superconductors you have uh, sort of Cooper pairing and and uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, things you can find on polariton condensates uh, with with superconductors. Of course, closing the terahertz gap is going to be a, a key thing for our electronics and merging our light with uh, with with photonics. But um, these exciton polaritons and polariton chemistry, there's a there's a channel I've I found on YouTube called Polaris Polariton Chemistry Webinars, and they're doing a real good job of uh, teaching some of this stuff much better than I am. But uh, I'll have to um, refer you to their videos, but. We have nanoplasmonics, which is uh, yeah, yeah, these these polaritons, um, which are basically it's basically like a material waveguide that traps light. So light goes into a material and gets trapped in a material, and then if you pump this material and with enough light, it uh, builds up really heavily, and and you can create um, negative mass. This is a article on negative mass uh, and a new way to create lasers at University of Rochester using these. Uh, pumped polariton states and these uh, a lot of these sandwich materials are, are being investigated um, graphene sandwiches and uh, you know graphene layer sandwich between two other materials or or, or, or two graphene layers of bread with uh, some uh, with superconductor in between um, there's been room temperature superfluidity in a polariton condensate reported and room temperature uh, exciton polariton condensate and lattice so it's a it's a very easy way to um, do condensed matter uh, and condensed light coupling, condensed matter light coupling. It's um, it's much easier than creating Bose-Einstein condensates or um, a lot of these other kinds of, uh, you know, more exotic matter states that have been done in, in laboratories. It's easier if we create these sort of um, layered sheets and um, these layered materials the right way. See, these are the graphene sandwiches I'm talking about. They put a, they, this one has a superconductor in, in between. This one has, um, I forget what they had in that one. This one's got cal calcium atoms and stuff, but they're basically a whole bunch of stuff that you can find on 2D layers of graphene with various materials sandwiched in between. And um, twisted bilayer graphene is also a thing when you get to a magic angle um, it becomes suddenly uh, superconductive along one axis uh, which is super interesting um, learning intricate things about how to exploit quantum mechanics using materials um, I wanted to talk about yeah I mentioned David Perez in this uh, he's talking he's building a spacecraft with this uh, technology he's testing um, and he's using you zoom in really close on his circuit boards. He's these are uh, snowflake. These are like Koch snowflakes. And uh, there's a guy um, named David Cohen, um, Nathan Cohen, I believe, Nathan Cohen, and he runs Fractal Antenna Systems, where he builds. Uh, he takes these like Koch snowflake patterns and does like you know numerous iterations on them, and and finds that you know when he builds these antennas on based on fractal patterns, they get um, they tune in they become metamaterials basically and they become super resonant and uh i guess this is what he's trying to do with this although you know you could i i suppose you could do this a, lo a lot better you could do a lot better than this we could do a lot better than this and we should be doing a lot better than this uh, another thing worth mentioning are flying donut pulses um schematics for you know they're also called spatio-temporal optical vortices so if you want to look up, sometimes they change the terminology on these things to obscure them and so make them harder to find. But 
Uh, this is a schematic of a metamaterial generator of flying donut pulses. Um, concentric rings of azimuthally oriented linear dipole resonators with spatially and frequency dependent scattering properties led to the emission of a toroid single cycle flying donut pulse. The resonator in different rings exhibit a different frequency dispersion, see the inset, and uh, so the temporal and frequency form of the single cycle radially, radially, um, sorry. I can't read the rest because this thing's in my way. But um, in any case, oh God, it, and there it goes back as soon as I try to exit. All right, never mind. Screen. Oh. No, that's not what I wanted. Um, hold up, I'm trying to show, present, okay. Oh, now I'm way up here for some reason. Hey man, I skipped a bunch of slides, I swear. Let me just make sure I didn't miss any as I go back down through this list. Oh, come on. I'm not using that mouse wheel. That mouse wheel is cursed. All right. All right. So materials engineering, optical materials, and now we're getting down into these layered types of two-dimensional materials, um, also two-dimensional uh, waveform materials, shaping their materials like waveforms. Um, then these really interesting flying magnetic donut pulses, uh, things which are kind of an anomaly in physics and uh, then also holographic Higgs um, scalar light matter coupling there's uh, some interesting um, papers on light scalars in composite Higgs models and also um, light light um, matter coupling uh, with the Higgs boson and Higgs mechanism which is the gravity field itself uh, so when we talk about light matter coupling, we're talking about you know trapping trapping light inside of these metamaterials, um, producing polaritons, and um, and then what are also called time crystals. Uh, so this is kind of relates to the um, those amorphous metals in the metallic glass and the, these sort of um, bendy resonant structures, and the idea that our UFOs are shaped like a bell or a, a saucer. Um, or a symbol for a drum set, you know. So this this uh, this symmetry and this sort of metal uh, shape is ideal, I, I believe, for uh, creating you know matter uh, resonances. And when you have a uh, matter that's oscillating or resonating in time, and then you have that matched to um, a light coupling with uh, these two light waves canceling to create a scalar light field in conjunction at the same frequency of your um, vibrating surface of the craft, um, you could produce what are called time crystals. Um, and time crystals could be used to create, you know, basically, you know, gravity, uh, warp drive. And this might be kind of, you know, where we, we, we're going in the future with these uh, nano coatings and these nano, nano um, technologies and stuff. And uh, I had that as the last bit of my presentation. Um, but I will uh, end it with a with a quick um, jump over to Battelle's website, um, who just got and Battelle was just awarded this forty six point three million dollar contract to support manufacturing of materials for extreme hypersonic environments. Um, so these are the skin coatings for these Mach five plus craft um, that they're admittedly developing. Although you know, I think it goes a little bit beyond that. Um, especially with, uh, it sh you should realize it, it, it goes a little bit beyond that with some of the stuff that we covered to in today's presentation on materials. And um, I hope there, there was, uh, I'm sure there's lots of stuff that I missed and um, let, let's, let's bring the, that up and, and let's get some comments and, and questions and discussion on some of these ideas and, and, and some of these things.